Connor family and friends, and I am so glad that you guys are here with us for the best 1010 yet. If you are a first-time visitor, I hope you were greeted at the door, and I hope you received a Connect card. If you don't mind to fill that out for us, and at the end of the service where we serve coffee, we will have a special gift for you, just our way of saying thank you and for being here with us today. Also, in the back, there are some silver boxes if you feel led to give to the church. Just slip your little envelope in there for us if you don't mind. And um, I just want to say thank you guys for coming out and being here with us today. If you don't mind, please stand and let's worship. your 
God, we come to you today, and we just thank you so much for letting us be in your house. And God, I just ask that you open hearts and open minds today as Mike brings your word. And God, I just let us sit here in this moment and realize that if we were the only person, you would have still died just for us. God, you are so good. And I ask that as we go through this day, through this week, that you just pour yourself over us in ways that we have to know it's only you. Because, God, you are so good. Um, thank you so much for this day. And, God, please um, speak through Mike and hide him behind the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of y'all ready. Good morning. There we are. Hey, I've been going since about 5 o'clock. Y'all got to get with it, all right? No, so again, I just want to take this time to welcome you to what we know and believe is the best 1010 10 yet. Uh, and it's simply because God is here. God's going to have his way with his people. And God's got a word for his people. Amen. Anytime the word of God is open, you ought to be attentive. You ought to pay attention. You ought to, it, it doesn't matter if it's me speaking, whoever it is, you ought to get respect. That God's word is open and his word is being taught. And so, man, we're super excited about today. We, we, uh, we're going to finish up a series, but uh, let me say this. Uh, one of these days, I'm just waiting for Jacob one of these days to say, man, why you keep moving that table? I get up there and put that table in a spot. And then, he, uh, then, then Jacob, uh, Jacob Stanley said, man, I knew it was going to happen one of these days. <laughs> Knocks that thing over, right? But it's all those, here's the thing. All of that is insufficient, amen, because he is all sufficient, and he's enough, and so if you're a guest of ours, we're, we're glad that you chose to be a part of our family today, and uh, we hope you were greeted with a smile. That smile was genuine, not the, like, Walmart smile and the Walmart <laughs> thing, uh, but, you know, we hope it was genuine, uh, because here's the thing, as, uh, as guests, we intend for you to stay, uh, amen, and so we, we like for you to become furniture around here that moves, <laughs> So uh, here, here's the thing. We're, we're going to finish up this series today, but I do have to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. It's super, super exciting, and uh, one of them is this right here. Therefore, uh, the better part of maybe two, two and a half years, Encounter was without live worship, and that was that, that was that, that was that was painful. But I mean, God kept us through, and so you got to pay attention because there, there's something that's going to come out this week. Uh, that, that you want to be excited for, excited about, is that God has led us a worship leader, and so you're going to hear that, and you'll see it out on social media. Uh, so amen, give the Lord a hand for that. Uh, and again, those people that, that do a great job and serve, now that, whew, that ain't mine no more. It's somebody else's, but we're super excited about that. Uh, and that's just simply, it's God. It's God working in his time through his people. Uh, so the other thing is this, is, man, this here is what we're going to go through today is critical, and it's, it's not just me, it's not just leaders, 
It's not community group leaders. It's not just the elders. It's not the leadership team. It's not just staff. It's for every one of us. And we need to do this this year, and we probably need to do it more than once. But here's the thing is that we started off this thing, and we looked at prayer life talking about the, the tabernacle pattern. There, and, and here's the thing. You and I need a pattern because simply we get off track, right? We, we get off track. Now, me and I'm on, especially us, we, we get off track real easy. Uh, we're usually not detail-oriented people, okay? But we needed that pattern, and, 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 and God set that up for us, and we looked at that. And we discovered some great things in that, and we'll highlight one of them here in just a minute. But then we looked at this last week. We looked at posture in prayer, right? And our posture matters whether we have an effective prayer, whether we have a powerful prayer, whether we just going through the motion, whether we just we have a surface prayer. Because I believe God's called his people to be intentional and be intentional about prayer to him and talking to him. Because here's the thing, it doesn't matter. It may be insignificant to you, but it's significant to God. And God wants to hear from his people, no matter how small or how big you think it is. He wants to hear from us. And so we're, we're looking at that. But here, here's a couple things as, as we get started to help catch you up. And the first one was this right here. A praying church is passionate about prayer and prays for the advancement of the gospel. See, I don't pray for the advancement of Encounter Community Church. What I pray for is the advancement of the gospel because I know if Encounter advances the gospel, guess what's going to happen? The church is going to grow. Amen. That's natural. It'll grow. If it ain't about the gospel, then it might grow, but it'll, it'll wither. And we need to be passionate about prayer. You need to start your day. I don't know about but mine is early. And I just do it because nobody else in the house is up. Nobody wants to get up with the rooster. But my dogs, they do. They clockwork about 3 or 4 o'clock. But, you know, you got to get up and you got to be intentional. You got to make time for that stuff. And prayer is powerful. Who, who believes prayer is powerful? I do. Amen. It's powerful. Prayer has got me through some of my darkest times. But can I say this? Prayer has also gotten me through some of my mountaintop highs. Amen. And everywhere in between. Because here's what I know. It, it, it can be lonely, but I'd rather be lonely doing the right thing, stepping in tune with the spirit, feeding the spirit, than over here with ten people feeding the flesh. Amen. You got to worry. You got to see about the company you keep. Here's the other thing we discovered when we talked about posture in prayer. It was this right here. When you approach God in prayer, what is the posture of your heart? And that's really what matters. The posture of your heart can affect whether you have a powerful prayer or not. And I believe we need to be a powerful praying people. And if we're a powerful praying people, then we'll be a powerful praying church. But it's your heart. Because, see, we can dress up. You know, you might see me in jeans and a hoodie one day. You might see me. Somebody, somebody actually teased me this morning. They said, man, y'all, you must have a Baptist men meeting after church. <laughs> I, said, I said, no, we don't have a Baptist men's meeting. We did have a men's breakfast yesterday. We had all that good stuff, pork. It was good. Ooh, hey, man, it was good. But the thing is this, when you go to God in prayer, what is, is your heart? Because if your heart's not right, what is that prayer? Can you even call it prayer? I can dress it up. I can dress up. I can look good. I can cut the grass. I can go out there and power wash that white fence and make sure it's all clean. But what's on the inside? Because some of us, we put on and we dine away, we're rotting away on the inside. And we're going to wrap this series up, and we're going to talk about something that's, that's critical for you and I. We're going to talk about something that is, here's what you and I need to do. We need to pray that we share. Don't throw that up yet. We need to pray that we share. I want you to pray that you would share. And you may say, Pastor Mike, share what? I think you need to share your knowledge. Amen. I think you need to share your wisdom. I think you need to share your blessings. Yes, your blessings may be different from other people. But in Psalms 23, when he, say, when he says that, that, that my cup runs over. And surely what will follow? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. See, your blessing is to, to spill out into other people's lives. Your blessing might be different from mine, but I can use my blessing to help uplift you and encourage you. 
right? You need to share that. I think you need to share your talent. Amen. There's some of you in here that probably, that, that the Lord, here's what I know. Everybody in here has a talent. Everybody's got a gift. Are you using that gift? Are you using that gift to help grow God's kingdom? Are you using that gift to glorify his name? Now, I've already told y'all once, and I said that, the Lord did not give me the gift of singing. He just didn't give me that. He gave me a gift to talk. Sometimes my wife said I talk too much, but that's all right. Sometimes you might need to share your time. Amen? What about sharing your time with people? But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those things are important, but I'm talking about this right here. You need to pray to share your story with somebody this year. Amen? And you might say, Pastor Mike, that's scary. You don't know. I got I to gotta pull it back, man. I got to open up. See, the veil was torn, amen, so that we would have a way. And here's the thing. You need to share your story with somebody because here's what I believe. Your story is unique. Your story is powerful. And somebody out here in Davis County is waiting to hear your story. Your story might be the next reason that pushes them through the door. Come on, because somebody shared Christ with you. Amen. Somebody share how Christ changed their life. Somebody prayed for you. I know God rest her soul. I know I owe a lot of things I have in life right now to the prayers of my grandmother. Somebody shared with you. What about this? Have you ever thought that maybe it's somebody you work with that needs to hear your story? And I know, man, you just don't know, man. I, I, got, a, I got a lot of skeletons <laughs> when he died. Amen. He died once and he died for all. And it's covered. Here's what you need to pray to share your story with somebody. Let me ask you this question right here. Is it you're being silent about your Savior, Jesus Christ, that keeps people away? Come on. There's some seats in here. You won't know why the seat next to you is empty. Could it be that, that you're being silent about your Savior, Jesus? Is it keeping people away? Ooh, Pastor, you better move on. You ain't get no amens on that one. But think about that. You got to ponder that question. Here's what we're going to look at today. There, there's going to be, we're going to look at some characteristics of a personal testimony. We're going to look at these, and then I'm going to go through the scripture and show you what it looks like biblically of a testimony. The first thing is this. Realize this. A personal testimony has a price. Amen. Who can, who can challenge when you're born again? Praise the Lord. I'm not where I want to be, but praise the Lord, I'm not where I used to be. Amen. Who can challenge it? When you're born again, you have authority. Your life has authority. And it's not by you, but it's by God. Here's what also it does, a, a, a personal testimony. It communicates, right? It, it, it shouts loud and proud. Here's the thing. Your story, guess what? It's real and it's authentic. Nothing beats an eyewitness account. See, that's what happens in, 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 in the court of law. What do they try to do? They try to discredit a witness. What usually swings the case to the side of the prosecutor? When you got an eyewitness account on either end, you... Can I tell you this? Can't nobody tell your story like you. Amen? You can tell it to me and I can try. But nobody can tell your story like you. They can't. Here's the other thing it can do. Guess what? Characteristic of personal testimony, it relates. Somebody right now is going through what you've been through. Amen? Somebody right now is going through what you've been through and they need to hear you speak. Because here's what I know and believe. Yes, sometimes they'll hear it from here, but guess what usually gets people? It's, it's not from up here. Amen? I mean, you be real with people. Share your story. Go talk to them. Sit down. Have a cup of coffee with them. You know, I like coffee. I like Longhorns, too. Then y'all like stuffed mushrooms. <laughs> I know past appreciation month is long away, but, you know. But think about this. 
your story relates. And I'm going to tell you this, the circle of friends you have are not just there just for you. So you need to share your story with them, and they may need to share their story with you. Amen? They may need to do that. But you say, Pastor Mike, where do we see this in the Bible? I I just, because we we need to see it in the Bible. I'm glad you asked. I, I love the book of Acts. So turn to Acts. Turn to chapter 26. And we're going to look at this personal testimony. 26, 9 and 10 says this right here. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Now, y'all know we're we talking about Paul. And, and I, I'm telling you, there's nothing like an eyewitness account. Here, Paul is, is giving a firsthand account of his life, and Paul is doing this before King Agrippa. He's giving an eyewitness account of his life. And, and did you catch there what he said? I myself thought I must do many things contrary. Because, see, I'm telling you, it, 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 it wasn't, I mean, he was all about religion. And here's the thing you got to realize. At the time, his name was Saul. He thought he was doing what was right according to the law. And I'm talking about if he was alive today, I mean, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, all of them would have been after him. Educated. An educated person. And he says, contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. There's a lot of people out here today that's contrary to Jesus Christ. He's given an account of what happened, and he's given a personal testimony of his life. Well, what did Paul actually, what did he do to him when he was Saul? He punished him. Amen. Look what it says there. He shut him up in prison. And I love this earth. I mean, I, I don't love it, but here's, it's, it's a little bit of, I cast my vote against him. He can say that because he was a part of the Sanhedrin, and he had a vote. Now, remember, this is the same person, Saul, that was the coat holder for Stephen when they stoned Stephen. He's given a personal testimony. Verse 11 says this right here. There it is. Some contacts had to kick in. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities as if it wasn't enough says he persecuted them to the extreme now if you realize if you go back early in the book of acts it's just he 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 wreaked havoc on the church vehemently against the church vehemently against jesus and let me let me tell you this oh he observed saul observed religion like no other but see it was saul's relationship with god That wasn't right. And some of us today, what we do, we observe religion very well. Amen. We'll sit in a ministry celebration. We'll cast our vote for the budget. We'll cast our vote for certain things, but all throughout the rest of the year. Amen. We observe. See, he observed religion, but his relationship with God wasn't right. And you can observe religion all you want. You can come to all the prayer meetings. You can come to all the community groups. You can get up here. You can sing your heart out. But if this isn't right, he observed religion, but his relationship with God wasn't right. What he's trying to do is, is he giving you a testimony of what his life was like before? And here's what I know. Your life before receiving Jesus is a part of your story. You don't have to hide your scars. Amen? You don't have to hide it. You do not have to hide your scars. It's a part of your story. Your life before receiving Christ, let me tell you what, it is powerful. It can attest. Now, do we glorify that? No. But you do tell that part of your story because it is important. It's a part of who you are. 26, 12, and 13 says this, While thus occupied, I journeyed to Damascus with authority, and commission from chief priests. At midday, O king, 
along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. Now, you got to keep something in mind. What is his mission on this road to Damascus? Saul's on the road to Damascus. What is his mission? His mission is to bring death, hell, and destruction to the church. Now, I'm telling you, there's some people in your life right now, and we know them. They, 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 they work a regular nine to five, and you may work one. And, I mean, when they get off, man, it is drunk 30 for them, whatever time that is. And when I say if he can get Saul, he can get that person that you're saying, you know what, only God can get them. You're right, only God can get them, and God can get them through you. Amen? This man was on the road to Damascus, had authority, which means he had a decree that he could put them in prison to bring death, hell, and destruction on the church, and he sees a light from heaven. Can I tell you this? There's no mistake in being in God's presence. Amen. They see this light from heaven and it's shown all around them. That Here's the thing. It's that they couldn't escape it on this road. They couldn't escape this light. 14 and 15 says this. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Man, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, I bet I almost saw, I almost wish he didn't ask that question. Hey, Amen. What would happen if you asked it today? persecuting Jesus. Let me tell you this. If you're persecuting believers and followers of Jesus Christ, guess what you're doing? You're persecuting Jesus. Amen? If you're persecuting his believers and his followers, you're persecuting Jesus. I mean, not just Paul, not just Saul that fell to the ground. All of them fell to the ground. Why are you persecuting me? Because here's the thing, in a lot of churches, we'll white knuckle a whole lot of things. Oh, we didn't vote on changing the color of the carpet. Are we going to paint the walls? Can we have a smoke machine? No. <laughs> but think about that. We do. And yet, we got people. Dying going to hell every day, and we have the only hope that they can get. Amen. Here's the thing. I don't ever try to scare any, because if I can talk you into heaven, somebody can talk you out of it. I want the Spirit to convict you. Amen. I want the Spirit to, why are you persecuting me is what Jesus asked. And I love that scripture, that kick against the goads. What, what Jesus is basically saying, man, you, just, you ain't doing nothing by hurting yourself. Amen. You ain't doing nothing but hurting yourself. You ain't doing nothing but kicking yourself. We do that a lot today. We stick our own footwear in the mouth. Why are you persecuting me? Isn't it hard to kick against the goals? You're only hurting yourself, Saul. If you're persecuting believers and followers of Jesus Christ, guess who you're hurting? You're hurting yourself. Amen. That's not how, what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to build one another up, right? We're supposed to help carry one another's burdens. We learned last week that we're supposed to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. Not confess to somebody and then somebody go tell. It's one another. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You're right. Jesus is alive and not dead, and I'm so thankful for that. Amen. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Can I tell you this? How you receive Jesus is a part of your story. And Paul's giving this out before King Agrippa. Do you realize this? Do you realize those people that sent him on that same mission 
to wreak death, hell, and destruction on the church. Now he's got to give an account because of what he's done. They sent him on the mission. And in the midst of the mission, guess what? It got changed. <laughs> Amen? It got changed. 26 and 16 says this right here. Here's where it gets changed. But right, This is Jesus speaking. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. You're talking about powerful. Amen. I mean, the man is still on his mission, and he's on the, realize this, when he gets up from the ground, he can't see. He's blinded for a reason. Amen. He'll actually be blinded for three days. He said, rise and stand. See, this, this purpose, this mission you was on, it doesn't align with what I have for you. And God had to do it in a supernatural way. He had to do it where Saul couldn't make any excuses. This light shone around him, and then he's blind. See, Saul, you can't, here, here's why Saul needed those others with him. Because God knew what he was going to do. He was going to have them eyes shut for a few days, and somebody was going to have to lead him on to where he was supposed to be. Because had he been able to see, he might try to backtrack and go somewhere else. He might try to be like Jonah, that reluctant prophet. But he didn't. He, he's blind for a reason. Jesus has a greater purpose for you than what you're probably living right now. Amen? He had a greater purpose for Saul. And when I tell you, man, I mean, if he can get Saul, he got me out of the muck, the mire. The muck. My name had been running the ground. They said I wouldn't amount to nothing. They said I wouldn't be nobody. I even had own family tell me I wasn't going to amount to nothing. Who are you? You're not the Alpha and the Omega. You're not the beginning and the end. You're not the author and finisher of my faith. Amen. Verse 17, 18 says this right here. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I'm trying to tell you there's nothing like a personal testimony. And Paul is standing rock solid, giving it before King Agrippa. And could nobody give it like Paul? I'm going to tell you, I, I, it's no secret. I love sports. I think it had been three weeks since I mentioned sports, so it's about time for me to mention. Right? But you can, you can bring somebody and you can bring a great speaker in to speak to a team. And they might hear it. But if that speaker hadn't played, if that speaker ain't been on that court, if that speaker ain't dribbled that ball, if he hadn't told it that football, if he hadn't scored a touchdown, if he hadn't won a state championship, how is he going to inspire somebody else to win one? Amen? How are you going to inspire somebody to take on this thing called Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior if it's not inspiring you, if you haven't done it? See, you can't share what you don't possess. Amen? You cannot share what you do not possess. And I love this verse here, 17 and 18. There's so much. We could unpack this forever and ever and ever. But I know y'all trying to hit the buffet. But it's, we getting fed right here. He says, I will deliver you. You realize that he's being delivered from the Jewish people and now is being sent to the Gentiles. Some of y'all missed that. He's being sent to the foreigners. See, the Jewish elite, they didn't, Gentiles wasn't worthy. Right? He's being delivered from the Jews, sent to the Gentiles. And I love Paul, he, he can't even open his eyes. And God is still giving a purpose. He said, here's your new mission. He gets a little more specific. I'm going to send you to them. To open their eyes. And 
Do you get this? His eyes is shut, he's blind, and then he's sending him to open the eyes of other people. That's amazing. And he says, open their eyes to what? To turn them from darkness to light. Amen? I'm telling you, this here is nothing like an eyewitness account to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may. Them people you call foreigners, them people that you said they ain't good enough, them people that you said, man, it's going to take an act of God to get them. He said so that they can receive what? Forgiveness of sin and an inheritance. My, my, my. Good God Almighty. Amen. I'm telling you. This stuff can change people's life. Your story has the ability. And here's the thing to change the trajectory of someone's life and to do it for all eternity. Amen? Your story, you need to share it, is powerful. I know this. I love what David Guzik said about this. He said this, the commission of the Christian is not to make the message or his testimony serve him. He is called to serve the message. Amen? Come on. Because, see, some of us, now you got to be careful. You'll go out there and you want to share your story so you can do this right here. <laughs> to, to see how many likes you can get, to see how many loves you can get, to see how many care buttons you can get, to see how many shares you can get. Hey, oh, woo! Preacher, now you're trying to tell us how to act on social media. I ain't trying to tell you how to act. I'm just trying to give you some good guidance. Amen? Your story is not just for you. Man, look at what what I mean. Just think think of this. Think if Paul had just shut up before King Agrippa and said nothing, like some of us do today. We get an opportunity. Your platform is your platform. Amen. You know, there's something else that I, I you know I, I desire because I love I love barbershop talk. It's nothing like barbershop talk. But see, Lord didn't bless me with clippers. So I, all I can do is this part right here. If I get up here, I might as well cut it off. I'm going bald. What you have and the way God has given you and your platform, use it to uplift Jesus. Amen? Doesn't matter what it is. Use it. Use it to uplift Jesus. Use it to, to encourage people. Use it to invite people to church. Use it to invite them to, you know what, have a relationship with Jesus. Because you don't have to have a degree. You don't have to have a degree from Clear Creek Bible College. You don't have to have a degree from Liberty University, though I am a Liberty University alum. I, I, I love it. But you don't need a degree from Liberty. You don't need a degree from Southern Seminary. You don't need a degree from Southwest. What you need is Jesus. And Jesus will give you what to say. Acts 26, 19 through 21 says this right here. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient, to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles, they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. 22, we're going to read on. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. Stick to the script. 23 says this, that Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Paul is stern and bold right here. He's telling King Agrippa, I don't care what you, what you come up with, you can trump whatever charges you want, I'm going to be obedient to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Even if everybody else is going to be disobedient, I'm going to be obedient to Jesus. And he says, I've called all the region of Judea, not some. I've called them all. And here's the thing, to repent. Repent is twofold, okay? Repentance is you turn away from sin and then turn to God. Repentance is not this. Turn away from sin and turn to another sin. Because, see, then there's no repentance there. You're not sorry for what you've done. You're just sorry you got caught. Amen? Uh-oh. 
Pastor better move on. He says, repent and do things befitting of repentance. Amen. And I love what he said there today. I will proclaim the light to the Jews and Gentiles. So that person you think it's, uh-uh, man, you don't, no, it's for them. Amen. It's for you. It's for everybody. It's for the whole world. Jesus died once and for all. Here's what I know about your life after receiving Jesus. Your life after receiving, receiving Jesus is part of your story. Shout it from the rooftop. Amen. I don't know about you, but who, if you can't be excited about your story and what God has done, right? We shout everything else. Amen. I mean, I was glad Kentucky decided to play a little defense. But, dude, we shout everything else. Shout your story. Your life after receiving Jesus is worth shouting. It can change somebody's life. It can change the world one life at a time. Paul certainly gives us a great picture, right, of a personal testimony. Your life before Christ, how you receive Jesus, and your life after Jesus is important. All three of them. You can't just have received and after. There was a before, amen? And you may not be too proud of it, and you shouldn't be. But it is a part of your story. It's a part. Do you realize this? You sharing your story is presenting the gospel. You look at it like that? Now, I I, I borrowed something. I have to give them credit. It's, It's from a place called Continuous Witness training, it's, it's called a gospel presentation outline, and this is how we're going to close this out. John 14 and 3 says this right here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen? Do you realize that? Do you realize that he said, I am coming again? See, this is the beautiful thing about the gospel. This is the beautiful thing about Jesus. Jesus doesn't just leave us to ourselves. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. Jesus is coming back. Amen. He's coming back. Here's what I know. And you you can go a lot of different directions with with that discussion. Here's what I know. Jesus is coming back. And he says he's coming back to receive you. Now, Jesus is coming back to receive his people. The first part of this gospel presentation is God's purpose. you got to understand God's purpose. God's purpose was for you to always be in a relationship with him. Amen? God's purpose was for you to know him, to do life with him. It's about him. God, he's he's preparing a place for you right now as we speak. As this is being shared, there's a place being prepared for you. And I love the fact that he said, if I go, I'm going to come again. See, you don't realize that's why he had to leave. Amen. God's purpose. Romans 3, 23. And then 6 and 23 says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It didn't say some have sinned. It didn't say that, 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 you know, for all have, you know, some of you done this, some of you done that. We are the people that like to categorize sin. Sin is sin. He says, for all have sinned and fall short. Your pastor has fallen short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when it says all, it means all. Amen. So if you put yourself on a pedestal, take yourself down. Here's the thing. If you put your pastor on a pedestal, take him down. Amen. For all have sinned and fall short. But here's what I know. See, there was a price for sin. When he says for the wages, wages mean you go punch that clock. You want them to give you that paycheck, right? It says for the wages of sin is death. And who was going to pay the price? There was only one befitting that could pay that price. And it was Jesus Not only was there God's purpose in the presentation, but there's our need. See, 
You and I can't save ourselves. And a lot of times we run around here like we can. We know it all. Here's the thing. If you and I could save ourselves, we'd never know Jesus. Amen. And there's some that believe, you know, there's this, you know, uh, uh, there's this go between. Well, maybe you No, if 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 you have to sit somewhere until your sins are atoned for, then why Jesus? There was no reason for it. He is the way. And when he died, he died once and he died for all. So look at this right here. First Corinthians 15, three and four says this. For I deliver you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I'm trying to tell you, man, about Jesus. It says that Christ died for all. We've already discovered everybody's sin. He died for all. Here's the thing. And guess what? He didn't stay dead. Amen. You and I don't serve a dead God. Can I tell you this? Buddha's not coming back. Amen. The only one that's coming back. Allah is not coming back. The only one that's coming back is Jesus. He's the only one that's defeated death in the manner that he did. And he says he was buried, rose again. Not only do we have God's purpose, do we have our need, but we have God's provision. See, God looked out. God looked and saw what a mess that we had made of the world. And he said, you know what? I can fix it and I'm going to fix it. But I've got to send my son. It's got to be. Can I tell you this? God's provision for your life is way better than what you have. Amen. See, you think you've got this thing all figured out. See, I mapped my life out. I was supposed to be in the NBA, but I'm only 5'8". And I couldn't dunk. I hated talking. See, I went to school when you had the card catalog. It wasn't Google. And you had to do book reports. And you... All this, man, I hate it talking in front of people. I'm just trying to tell you what happens when you give way to God. God can do something that you would never, ever imagine. And God's provision is way better than yours. It's better than mine. And Romans 10, 9 and, 9 and 10, as we close out right here, says this. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Church, you have a story inside of you that's waiting to be shared with a world that's dying. What is holding you back? You have, he said it, believe in your heart. You got to confess with your mouth. You got to believe in your heart. So what you can't speak well. Moses tried to say he couldn't speak well. And God was his mouthpiece. I told the Lord, I don't like talking in front of people. I would have never, ever envisioned myself being a pastor. Who does that? The Lord does it. The Lord does it. God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. And he said, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So there's God's purpose. There's our need. There's God's provision. What's your response? Amen. What's your response to what God is doing in your life? What's your response to how God wants to use you? What's your response if you've never received Jesus? What's your response? Because I know this scripture says today is the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. And this is no, I'd, I'd love to see the 49ers win later on tonight. But if I don't make it to tonight. I'm t- that's the reality. I know I'll be in glory with him. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you. Lord, and we praise you for all that you've done, all you continue to do. Lord, you are God and you're God alone. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus, that Jesus died for our sins. And Father, that you call us to live a life befitting of repentance. We're made in your image, Lord. Let us live in that light. Let us project that image. And Father, you have your way with this time of invitation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.